This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Our series for five Sundays, with this Sunday being the third of five, is live like you'll live forever. And today it takes up the topic of stewardship and it says the theme for this Sunday in the five-week series is live a life of startling generosity. And we'll see that in the readings for today. We'll begin our worship then with our opening hymn. Please arise. We begin our worship in the name that God placed on us in our baptism when he adopted us as his dearly loved children, the name you and I still bear today as we gather here to worship him. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. 
Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We bow our heads and pray. Almighty and ever living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Grant us so firmly to believe in your Son Jesus that our faith may never be found wanting. Through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Get up, go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and live there. I have commanded a woman there, a widow, to provide for you. So he got up and went to Zarephath. He came to the city gate, and there he saw a widow gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar so that I can have something to drink. When she went to get it, he called to her, 
please bring me a piece of bread. She said, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I have no food except a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a pitcher. See, I am gathering a couple of sticks so that I can go and prepare it for myself and my son so that we can eat it and then die. Elijah said to her, Don't, do not be afraid. Go and do just as you said, but first make a salt, small loaf of bread for me from the flour and bring it out to me. Then go and make another for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not run out, and the pitcher of oil will not become empty until the day the Lord sends rain to water the surface of the ground. So she went and did exactly as Elijah said. He and she, as well as her household, were able to eat for many days. The jar of flour did not run out, and the pitcher of oil did not become empty, just as the Lord had said through Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll now say the psalm of the day. You'll hear the echo of the blessing at the end of the service. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You'll hear that echoed in this beautiful short psalm. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May his face shine on us. So that your way may be known on earth. Your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May the peoples praise you, all of them. May the countries be glad and sing for joy. Because you rule the peoples with theirs. And you guide the countries of the earth. May the peoples praise you, all of them. The earth will yield its hearts. God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. In the second reading, we have chapter 8, the first nine verses of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are possibly the most outstanding words on the subject of Christian stewardship in all the Bible. Uh, he points the Corinthian Christians to the example of the Macedonian Christians to the north, and the Macedonian Christians lived in poverty, and yet they were an example of startling generosity. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace of God that was given in the churches of Macedonia. In a severe test of trouble, their overflowing joy and their deep poverty overflowed into an abundance of their generosity. I testify that of their own free will, they gave according to their ability and even beyond their ability, pleading with us with an urgent request for the gracious privilege of joining in this service to the saints. And they did this not as we had expected, but in keeping with God's will, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. As a result, we urged Titus, since he had already made a beginning to bring to completion this gracious gift on your part, but just as you overflow in every way, in faith, and word, and knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you also overflow in this gracious gift. I do not say this as a command, but to test how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. Alleluia. 
you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. The Holy Gospel is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, these verses. It contains the well-known story of the widow's might. He also, Jesus also said to them in his teaching, Beware of the experts in the law who like to walk around in long robes and receive greetings in the marketplaces. They love the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and offer long prayers to look good. These men will receive greater condemnation. Jesus sat down opposite the offering box and was watching how the crowd put money into it. Many rich people put in large amounts. One poor widow came and put in two small bronze coins worth less than a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, Amen, I tell you, this poor widow put more into the offering box than all the others, for they all gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. you may be seated.
Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. For our sermon today, we have the famous and beautiful story of the widow's mite. Jesus is at the temple with his disciples. He sits down and he watches the worshipers there deposit their gifts in the offering box. There are the wealthy who deposit large gifts, and here comes a widow. And she puts in that box two copper coins, uh, two lepta is the word in the Greek. And lepta is the Greek word from which our word leaf comes from. You're probably raking or blowing leaves at your homes this time of year, right? And those leaves, if they're not too wet, are so light, right? They blow easily away. And these Two coins are called lepta because they're made of a copper that is exceedingly thin, almost as thin as a leaf. Wow. Thinner than our pennies. And that's all she put in. And Jesus says she gave more than everyone else. More than the wealth. I mentioned once before that sometimes we get the wrong idea from this story. I was with a man when I was a vicar on the south side of Milwaukee during my last year at the seminary. And he, I was visiting him in his home and he told me that he uh, was like the widow in the story of the widow smite. And he said, uh, she gave a little, then I give a little. <laughs> and he gave almost nothing. And he was proud because he thought he was in the class of the widow whom Jesus praised. But what's the difference? The widow, Jesus says, gave all that she had. What percentage is that? Is that 10%? 20? It's 100, right? Yeah. This fellow was giving less than 1%. Quite a difference, wouldn't you say? Uh, why do our offerings matter to the Lord? Do you think he needs our money? He says the cattle on a thousand hills are his. And by the way, if we th think at all about it, who gave us our possessions? To whom do they really belong? We actually own nothing. When we leave this world, we leave it all behind. What we have, we have only for a little while. And the source is the Lord. So what does Jesus want us to learn from this heart-touching story of a widow who put in everything she had? Isn't it that what God really values are not gifts of copper, but hearts of gold? He looks at the heart. And this is what he wants to see. Hearts of love and hearts of faith. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can tell what's important to a person by how they spend their money. We work hard to earn our money, and we don't spend it on things that don't matter to us, right? Maybe some of you remember the late night comic who replaced Johnny Carson, Jay Leno. He loved cars, 
In fact, he had a collection of 161 vintage cars and 140 motorcycles. He had a garage that could house all of them and he had a restoration team that worked nearly every day of the week restoring those vehicles. It was estimated to be valued at $54 million. It doesn't take a genius to know cars were his love, right? Is God important enough to us that we will dedicate to him a generous portion of our income? Do we give him the first and the best or do we pass on leftovers? A missionary told the story about islanders in the New Hebrides in the South Pacific and in their worship of false gods, they would sacrifice a pig. They would eat the pig, and then when they were done, they would take the tail and they would throw it into the bushes. And they said the pigtail was for their God. I think all of us know pigtail giving isn't what the Lord has in mind. In our epistle, one of the passages said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus lost everything to give us everything. There was no sacrifice he did not make for you and for me. We love him now because he first loved us. We have the greatest needs of our soul satisfied. We have life that will never end. We have full and free forgiveness. It's free, but it wasn't cheap. It cost him his life. And now we show our gratitude not to be saved, but because we are saved by honoring him with our best in all areas of life. And yes, we are often selfish, this is true, but that's why he died on the cross to wash away our sins of selfishness with his selflessness. We love because he first loved us, and so we want to honor him with our best. Um, I was reading the book of First Kings and how Solomon built the temple and his own palace over a period of 20 years. And he used the cedars of Lebanon from outside of Israel to the north of Israel, and he had a friendship with King Hiram of Tyre. And for 20 years, he had men labor in the forest of Lebanon, cutting down these magnificent cedars, and they would ship them to the southern part of Israel, either on a road or along the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, and then inland to Jerusalem. And this was just a magnificent gift from a Gentile king. It makes us think of how the Gentiles will be included in the church of God. And then after 20 years of largesse, King Solomon gave 20 cities in Galilee, just south of Lebanon, to King Hiram as a gesture of gratitude. King Hiram went to look at the 20 cities and when he saw them, he realized they were miserable towns. And he says, what is it with these cities you have given to me? 
and he called them the land of Kabul, K-A-B-A-L, which means good for nothing. Hiram had given his best to Solomon, and Solomon repaid him with these towns that were worthless. We want to use our bodies, our lives, our time, our skills, and yes, our treasure to honor the God who bought us not with silver or gold, but with his holy precious blood by reserving for him a generous portion of our income for him. So what God is looking at isn't the copper or the paper bills. He's looking at the heart. And as he has loved us, so he wants us to love him. As he looks for gifts of love, he also looks for gifts of faith. It's love and faith that God desires. And you may say, well, what's faith got to do with my offerings? Well, quite a bit, actually. When we give a generous portion of our income to God, we are showing that we trust in him to provide for our needs. Now, if you throw pennies at God and you're blessed with a large income, how much faith does that really take? Really none, right? But when you extend yourself, you're showing, Lord, you will provide. You're taking his word to heart. You're trusting in his promises. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your offerings. And then your fields will be blessed and your vats will brim over with wine. Jesus said in Luke 6 verse 38, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured to you. You cannot outgive God. So what matters to Jesus isn't copper or gold or dollars but our hearts and how we use our wealth is an extension of what is in our hearts i served in nepal and it's called the poorest country in asia The people there eat two meals a day, generally, because there isn't enough food to eat three meals a day. And half of all children, 51%, according to the United Nations, are malnourished. And I'll see these men, and they are so thin because they grew up with very little food. Their waists are so tiny. Uh, But I, and I, I, I had one student in seminary class named Prasad. And one day I had him come to the front of class and I wanted to give a demonstration of Jesus on the cross. And so I had him raise his arms up and to pretend that he was Jesus in this illustration. And then I noticed he had big holes in his shirt under his arms. And he had worn that shirt practically every day. And he always tried to hide the holes so he'd keep his arms down alongside of him. 
Later, I was out in the countryside, and we visited the place where he served as a pastor. And they were building a church, and he had donated the land for that church. He was a young husband with a wife and two children. He himself was quite thin because he didn't have a lot to eat. And he gave this piece of land that he could have sold so that a church could be built for people to hear the word and grow in faith. He also took care of his mother who had dementia. And I saw a picture of the love and faith of the widow in Mark chapter 13. Hearts filled with faith and with love. So God calls to us to give our all, to give our best, to say thank you, Jesus. You have given me the pearl of great price, a treasure that rust and and moths cannot destroy, and thieves cannot break in and steal. And so I give to you my all. I'll close with a hymn verse that says, Love so amazing, so divine. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul my life, my all. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we ask you to fill out the care cards which allow us to watch for our dear brothers and sisters in our fellowship and also extend hospitality to our visitors. Thank you for filling those out. Confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And now we'll sing our hymn, Gracious God, You Send Great Blessings. You may be seated. Please rise for the prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. 
Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms, enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. <clears throat> Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Lord God, we pray for these dear brothers and sisters, for Harry Schmidt, who is in excruciating pain as he has experienced a broken vertebra in his back. We pray also for Harriet Kappelman, the 94-year-old mother of our brother in Christ, John Kappelman, who is sick and may be dying. We pray also for Lynette Gregerson, who underwent hip surgery yesterday and has returned home this afternoon. Be also with Jane Novak, who is fighting a recurrence of melanoma cancer. Lord God, during your ministry on earth, you always had a heart for those who were suffering. You never passed by those in need without showing compassion. We ask that you will visit these dear believers and all who are battling illness or recovering from injury. We pray that they will find in you relief from their pain and strength in their weakness. Above all, remind them that they are safe in your arms and that you will care for them in body and soul and one day receive them unto eternal life. We also pray for our nation and our leaders. We ask that you will be with those who hold office in our land. We think of the current president and the new president. We think of our senators and our representatives. We think of our governor in this state and also our state representatives and state senators. We pray also for our judges throughout the land and for those who serve in law enforcement. We ask that you will give them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that they will rule according to your will. Help them to use the power you have given them to protect the innocent and to help those who are in danger. We lift up our eyes to you. You are the king of all the earth and you rule the nations. We pray that you will bless your church even with, through the institution of government so that those who live in darkness will see your wonderful light throughout the world. Hear us, Lord, as we now pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. 
Hear us for Jesus' sake, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. announcement is one I was asked to make on behalf of our school. Uh, it's in the bulletin, but they wanted me to draw special attention. Friday, November 15th at 5.30 in the early evening, the children in the school are having what's called a taste of nations, and they're making food from a country of their choice. So if you come, there'll be food to taste from many different countries around the world. So that sounds delightful. And all of you are invited to come and sample some of the foods from around the world that our children have made. And we're able to bring the bread of life to people in many countries around the world. We thank God for you, and God bless your evening with rest. Thank you.